for hanging out here. Uh, so Brad Parks, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Drove down here, didn't take the ferry because it's dumb and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the internet everywhere is Brad Parks. I'm online, Brad.parks.me. Um, I wanted to get PR.BS, but it's it's four hundred dollars a year. So if anyone wants to buy any of that domain name, please and thank you. Uh, I love WordPress a lot. If you see my laptop or anything like that, there's a ton of WordPress stickers. My car's WordPress sticker. You'll probably see it outside. I'm um, super passionate about WordPress. I also like startups. I'm really involved in the startup scene in Milwaukee. Um, help out with a couple startups. Um, got a couple of projects in the works, things like that. I like code. I'm definitely a developer. I like backend code and stuff like that, but I really, really like front end. Something like SaaS is like the perfect combination of those two, so I really like it. Um, I run this company called Study Group. We do uh, web. It's all that fun stuff in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Core interior in 3.5 and 3.6, working on the content block stuff for whenever that goes into WordPress. I like that features are now done as plugins and not as this is once in 3.7. I think that's really cool. I build plugins and themes both to put online for free and as well as for clients. I build a lot of cool tools. So I built Wolf, which is a SaaS based starter theme. We'll talk about that later. Hooks, which takes underscore us and puts a bunch of theme hook alliance hooks in it. And I really like this WP Wizard. Lets you do, if you're on a Mac um, or Linux, it lets you do a local WordPress installation in about 45 seconds. Um, in fact, point in your favorite theme framework or theme, all your favorite plugins, it's really cool. It's on GitHub, whatever. Um, so what's SAS? You can read all these words. Um, basically, SAS is, I'm going to use the word compile, but it's technically process. But when I say compile, just pretend it means process. But it's a language, and it's things you write that gets processed into CSS. Processed. Processed into CSS. Canada, sorry. Okay. Um, and it's really cool. So it's all these things when we, we talk about some of this stuff. It's all stuff that CSS should just have in it because CSS, we've been writing it the exact same way for like 10 years. We have new things in CSS3 like, oh yeah, gradients. And we don't use those anymore because now it's flat design. Um, and SAS is just a ton of power on top of CSS. And it lets you do really, really cool things. Uh, and it basically comes to, down to being more efficient. So you write less and you do more. Um, SAS is awesome. <laughs> 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 I got a lot of GIFs in here, so the other way you can leave right now. <laughs> um, so a lot of people have heard of less, mostly because of Twitter Bootstrap, because like that's super popular for some reason. Uh, but SAS and less share a lot of similar things, but SAS is way better. If you use less right now, Switch to SAS. If you haven't decided what you want to use, forget less, go on SAS. And there's three big points of why I like that. There's Compass, which is basically this huge library of mix-ins, which we'll talk about later, but they're basically a bunch of things people have done so you don't have to redo them. Um, with SAS, so it's really cool. Add Extend is amazing. It lets you basically do class inheritance inside of, C inside of your CSS. So it lets you have really, really clean markup. None of this, like, jib class, eight columns. None of that junk. Uh, and you can do media queries really, really uh, simple and easily. So it's really fun. So getting it installed, I'm actually working with um, SAS. There's a couple different ways. So compass.app, I think it's free, like 10 bucks. You can download that. It'll install the stuff you need. It's a little GUI. Uh, CodeKit is what I use. It's a GUI. Um, runs your menu bar on a Mac, and it does a bunch of cool things like JavaScript, junk, and image optimizations. It actually mutes your phone and silences it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, Scout does something else that's similar. I don't know. Uh, Free Pros doesn't have a logo, which is weird, but that works on Windows. Um, you still have to install like Ruby or Compass or something, but it's really simple. They give you guides. Uh, if you're like super matrixy, you can do command line stuff. You can use Grunt.js, which is fantastic and awesome. Got some some of these in the back, okay? Um, or you can just do it on the command line um, via Neo. <laughs> these these all are really simple and have instructions. If you want to do this, I can walk you through it later or whatever. Um, but we're going to assume you have it installed from this point on forward. So what you do, you get installed. You write some stats. So we are using some variables. We're doing some nesting and some color functions. You write that, you run it through whatever program you got. You become CSS, and you're done. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's two flavors of SAS. Um, there's two different 
your web uh, SCSS, and this is what I use. Um, so it's very, very similar to CSS. Um, there's curly brackets and there's semicolons and stuff like that. There's dot sass, which doesn't have curly brackets, it doesn't have semicolons, and it's all based on indenting white space. Um, so SCSS is way more similar to CSS. It's a lot easier to jump into because you can actually just grab your current CSS file, throw it in an SCSS file. Um, and this is probably where you want to start. That's what I prefer because it's way more similar to what I'm used to. Um, but ASS is less keystrokes. Your files are a little bit cleaner because there's not these curly brackets everywhere. Um, but other than that, they're pretty much the same. Um, I'm gonna. A lot, there's some people that call that SAS, and they always refer to this as SCSS. That's a lot of like more syllables to say, so I'm not gonna do that because um, they're both SAS. So decide what you want to do. They're they're six one way, half dozen the other. So, SAS on the left side, and what it becomes, SCSS, and we're just gonna like talk about why it's awesome. Any point there's questions, like just interrupt me, have to raise your hand and start talking. Um, and a lot of these examples, it's going to look like there's more SAS than CSS, and that's just because a lot of these are really simple. When you start doing this in like an actual project, you'll realize how much more efficient it is. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is nesting. Nesting is like the awesomest thing ever. So um, here we have an example of like kind of like a nav bar. Right in your CSS, which you'd normally write, you know, you got your nav bar, it's maybe got width and height. You got your UL that you want to like clean up a little. You got an LI with the actual text, and then that's a link. And you're like, you want to do different styles for all of those, and you always have to keep typing nav bar, and like, don't ever change what that ID is, because now you have to make sure you fix it everywhere. Um, and every time you got somebody else, maybe you're writing a submenu to this, you have to do like this huge um, selector, and it's dumb. The SAS looks like something really cool. We could do nav bar, open it up. Add our styles, and then inside of that, do a UL. And inside of that UL, we could do an LI just next to it. Um, and within that LI, we can do an A. And what this does is it does two things. Number one, it lets you write less. If we ever change this ID of navbar, we change it one place, and it's done. It also forces you to be a lot more organized. Because now our navbar styles are usually going to be in the same place. Um, this is really cool. One thing you want to watch out for, though, is don't feel like overboard with nesting. There's some people when they first start using SAS, they're like, oh, this is awesome. I can nest everything. And they end up with like seven layers of nesting. Um, and that's just because now you have a selector that's like really, really specific. Um, so just keep that in mind. You wouldn't use like seven selectors. You, know, you want to do like element ID and like class, descendant of this class with this element. Um, so you just want to keep that in mind. And you can't just do selectors, you can actually do um, like um, declaration. So we have some awesome class, another class nested in, we have a color red, and then font, we're going to nest our weight, our size, and our family. Um, and once again, I don't know about you guys, but when I write CSS a lot of times, I'm like, I'm going to keep all my declarations in alphabetical order and really clean and organize, and that lasts like one minute. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I've got to change like, the font family, and it's like in the middle, and then the next time it's there. Um, so you can like force yourself to be more organized. The more organized you are, the faster you can find things, and you'll just be a lot more efficient with your time. Um, when you do nesting, and we have a variable in here, just ignore that for now. You'll, if you understand, if you can kind of guess what it's doing, we'll go over it. Um, we have color functions, just ignore those two. Uh, so this is the parent selector reference, and it's the ampersand, and it lets you do like pseudo classes and different things. So when we nest something, it's automatically going to put that space. So when we add some class nested in an awesome class, it was what it generated was, you know, some awesome class space, some other class. We're doing a hover state of a link. We can't have that space in there. It has to be a colon hover. So you can use this ampersand, and it's going to pull in whatever it was nested inside of. So, for example, we have our A for our link. You usually want to do hover, active, and visited states, maybe focus on all of these. Um, you can nest those in, and then you're just going to use that ampersand to kind of say, hey, pull in whatever we're inside of. And once again, this is really awesome because now all our link styles are right here. And what's really, really cool we'll get to this is using color functions and variables to control all of these in a really like awesome, dynamic way. And you can do this to like chain classes together. So we have like a, a button with classes and then you know, our submit button, whatever you want to do. You can do it with pretty much anything you want to play. It also lets you do this very similar selector bubble up. And so we were talking about media queries before. This is amazing. So no matter how organized you think you are, you probably have a sheet of CSS, and like maybe you've got those organized, but then 
you like forgo all organization and all your media queries are piled at the bottom because you always want to make sure those like are the ones being run. And so like now you kind of have to organize things in two places. Well, SAS lets you just throw the media query inside of whatever you want. And this is really, really cool because now our media queries are attached to what we're actually styling um, and not just at the bottom and they're an afterthought. And so I use this all of the time. So here we have a pretty simple example. We have a wrapper, um, you know, max width 960 pixels, and then when we get to like a phone, it's gonna be 95%. Uh, this isn't the right way that you would do that. You want to do 95%, and if it's bigger than a tablet, do 960 pixels. Uh, always do mobile first when you're doing responsive. Uh, but this is really awesome. So you can do this within, maybe you nested too deep already and you threw a media query in there. It works fantastic. Which is kind of like a function, we'll cover that, to do media queries to make them even a little bit simpler uh, to type. And when you're actually doing responsive design, you're going to love this because, uh, like, you don't have to worry about, like, referencing what your classes were and, like, copying and pasting some stuff and, like, redoing styling just all in one place. And it's amazing. All right, so when you build a site, you always want to make sure you serve the least amount of HTTP requests, right? We all have, like, been taught one CSS file, one JavaScript file, like, ever. That sucks for writing CSS because, like, you just have one big file with a ton of junk thrown in it. Um, SAS, because it's running through this step of being processed and compiled, we have a lot more control. So you can build a ton of files that all do specific things, and then we process those all into one, and we're just delivering one minified CSS file. And this forces you to be a lot more organized. So on this side, we have um, my sort of thing, Wolf, how I set it up. So I have things like header, footer, forms, buttons, a uh, general layout. I pull in a grid system and a reset. Um, I use, it's built off underscore S, so I pull in some of their very minimal default styles. Uh, I have a folder, like a file for variables. I have a folder with a bunch of mix-ins and functions. And then I have a WP folder, which I made a bunch of blank files for, like, for a four page, um, you know, uh, like the you know, results page, the sidebar, things like that. And this guy did another way where he kind of has you know, typography in a folder with a bunch of different files there. He has a config file, layouts of the two different layout files. Uh, whatever you feel works best for you, there's no wrong way to do this file structure. What I recommend to people is just taking Wolf, how I did it, trying that for a project. If you find that you're having trouble figuring out which file to put things in, make a new file that makes more sense to you and kind of evolve from there and figure out your best process. Uh, and the idea behind it is you might have, you'll have the same class in multiple files, but when you say, oh, there's a, you know, I need to add this style um, that does something in layout, well, you know it's in the layout folder. So you end up with a bunch of files that are really, really small. So when you need to make changes, you know exactly what file it is. That file is really small, so it's really it's really easy to go through it. Um, you just be more efficient, and you're a lot faster because you're not you know finding and you're not control effing in a 400 line CSS file. You're not all right. Well, I had a table of contents at the top, but then I got halfway through and said F it and started putting stuff at the bottom. <laughs> which like you I, you'll say you don't do that, but we all do that. <laughs> CSS, CSS files, so I put all the like hacky CSS I do in there. Oh, um, the stuff that I'll refactor later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when we have spare time, right? Uh, but this is really cool, and it's, it's awesome. So there's a trick with it. So every SCSS or SAS file you have will automatically create the same CSS file unless you name it underscore or something. So I use underscore for everything except the style. CSS because I want to style that CSS. Uh, yes, and it's and there's links. I have my slides online. There's links so you can like check out these projects. Uh, cool variables. Variables are super popular, so um, they're really really nice. So you probably all, if you've done client work, um, you build a really nice site. Maybe they had designs. Maybe you helped do the discovery phase, but you built a site. Client goes, looks amazing. I love it. Um, but this shade of blue that we're using, like four different places on the site with different shades, um, can we make that a green? And you're like, okay, cool. And it's like two hours, of like, okay, you know, find and replace in your style sheet. And then you realize you have like a darker 
shade of that color and you find and replace that after you went like Chrome and like inspected elements and find that. And it's just a horrible process. And then you finally do it and the client goes, cool, I like this. <laughs> and it's just all for nothing. So variables are the same as variables in any program language. They just store a bunch of data. So you can use it to store like you know their main color scheme, like hex codes, and then use the variable throughout the site. And they go, hey, let's try it in a red, and you change it a few places, and you're done. Um, you can use it so like a wrapper width, 960 pixels, or a padding is 25 pixels. Um, you can do anything in there. So maybe you have, you know, you use like a box shadow different places, and you have different parts of it that you want to keep in a variable. Um, I put as much, as many things as I can into variables because if there ever needs to be a change, I can do it one place, and no matter where I use it on the site, it can change. Uh, so yeah, those are variables. Pretty cool. And extend, yeah. Is the scope of those um, Yeah, so it depends on the order that you add import. So when you import all the SAS files, um, if you call like so I call like my variables file really early. Anything that gets imported after can, can touch those. If I import, you know, like my layout file and then my variables file, because it was imported first, it can't touch them. Okay. So add extend is really cool. This is a horrible example of it, but it, it works. Um, so add extend is like the same as if you applied a class to something. It basically just inherits all of that. So here we have our H1 with a bunch of junk. We have an H2 that we want it to be the same as an H1, except it's a little smaller and the line height's different. So we can add extend H1, and it's going to grab, you know, we apply H1 and H2 are the same, and H2 has some other, some other junk associated with it because we declared that. And then large text, we want this class to be the same as an H1 for some reason, stylistically. We can add extend in H1, and they're going to share the exact same size. And this is really, really powerful because, so when I build up like a grid system, I don't have classes of row. I don't have classes of X columns. I have a class, like an ID. <laughs> content. An ID like second to myself, because those are more semantic for, you know, whatever you want to use to actually use normal classes. And then you can add extend eight columns or add extend row. And it, create, it makes your HTML a lot cleaner, because you can do things, rather than putting like eight classes on same, you can have one class and then add extend that class with other things. Um, and this gets really powerful in a minute when we talk about some other stuff. Uh, but basically, just remember add extend is whatever you're extending, it's grabbing that chunk and throwing it in there. Um, so here we have a grid system, you know, simple basic version of one. Four columns is whatever width, done at 12. We have like a row up here. So a wrapper is going to be a row, so we're add extend row and grab all of those classes. And then our main content is going to be eight columns, and our sidebar is going to be four columns. And when it pulls it in, we're going to have eight columns and content to share that. So we don't have to have content class eight columns. And this is really cool. And you can do this really fancy thing with, um, they're called silent selectors. So just like a dot is a class, and a, you know, a, a, a Octothorpe is an ID. Um, yeah, Octothorpe, nice. <laughs> <laughs> a percentage sign is basically the same thing, but it's never going to output into your CSS until you add extend it somewhere or you use it somewhere. So here we have our grid system, the same as the last example, but rather than a class of four columns, it's a silent one of you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve columns. And so we do the same thing. We're going to add extend our row, but it's silent. We're going to add extend eight columns for our content, four columns for our sidebar, and our CSS we only have wrapper sidebar content. So rather than outputting our grid system in our CSS for you know, our 12 column grid system, well, we're only using eight columns and four columns. Why have all the extra CSS? And so you can look, I mean, here, this is just a, you know, there's more CSS up here and down there. And these are achieving the same thing. And this is only 14 lines versus, you know, we're at 42 and we're at nine columns. There's way more down here. Uh, and this gives you like really small, efficient CSS because it's only outputting what you actually need. And now if we change this, and we have another something else that's going to add extend four columns. It's just going to add that to our CSS, and then we add on a little bit more. Uh, cool. So we're going to just keep flying through there. Any questions so far? Yeah. Can you do multiple add extend? For yes, you can. So, uh, for example, like in my theme, I primary and add extend like four or five things. Now is that all on the line, or do you... yeah? So you would do like. Um, so this is 
say we wanted like you know rows now add extent say columns and dash with eight and the class of columns you do add extent eight add extent columns. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, you get using multiple extents versus uh, I know you're just about to go to an instance. Yeah. You have a good column mixing ahead. Um, like you take first prime would be the number of columns, the second would be uh, you want to have others on either side or neither. Um, do, you have, do you prefer? Extends? So yeah, the reason I prefer extends is I want to build my own growth system. So I'm using like right now I'm using their foundation, uh, and so I just pull it in like there's CSS or there's an add extend that. Uh, that's a great uh, great point. You could do a mix in. There's there's absolutely there's absolutely no reason why not. You could even do a mix in that generates your added stems. Right. Um, cool. Good question. We can talk about it later. Yeah. Um, so mix ins are little functions, and they basically output um, whatever you want them to. So and it just has a bunch of styles associated with it. So right now this looks very similar to the add extend we just did. Um, but we'll show how mixins get a lot more powerful. And we do this add include, and we call the mixin. So here is add including content box. Doesn't really do anything fancy except output these styles, and it's an output them. Uh, but we can take mixins a step farther. Uh, well, here we have an example where inline block, if you've ever used it, it's amazing. But i8 sucks and can't do it. You have to do this like hacky like zoom one jump. I'm like, you I don't remember to type that every time. So I just have put less than IE9 in my header on my body, and then I do this like a cool mix. Less than IE9 and my parent selector um, and throw it out there. So you can do like utility functions like this. A bit more powerful in the extent. You can actually feed them variables because they're just functions. So here we have a basic one, we have size, and we're feeding it two parameters, width and height. And all it's outputting is our width is a variable width is, our height is a variable height. Uh, so variables that are always a dollar sign, we can talk about that, but they like to be in that way. And this just add include size, we feed our two parameters, and it's going to output whatever those are. And so this gets really fun when you do things like perspective, because the actual like CSS for it is, what, eight lines? And that's dumb. So we can wrap that in a mix-in, because they all take the same value. We call it a mix of the perspective. Now we just add include perspective, whatever we want to feed in. It's going to output a huge CSS. Uh, if we wanted to do it again with three M's instead of two M's, we just call it again, and it saves us from writing this huge thing. So this is awesome when you're dealing with vendor prefixes, um, especially when vendor prefixes have different ways to call things. You don't have to remember them all. You don't have to look it up. And so you can also set default arguments. So you can say like you know fallback. If we don't provide one. So here we have our mixin called border. We have a radius of 50% for some reason. That's the default. Uh, we have a style associated with it, you know, three pixels, solid red, whatever. Um, it's just going to output that. And then we're going to call it. In our first example, we're going to do border 10 pixels, 10 pixels dotted blue. That's going to output those because we have variables. And the second one we're just doing add include border. Because here in our mixin, when we did the parameters, we did a colon after the variable, and then we did what the default should be. And so that's how you, you do default arguments. And this is really cool, because um, we could do something like width and height. We could do a default of, you know, maybe our, our width is always going to default to 100% unless we define it, or something like that. Uh, and I think we get into, like, uh, yeah, we'll do, like, some directives. So we could do, like, if and else. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so here we have our, our height, where we did that if and else. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, we can do things like circle, where we you know, default to nothing, but we can, these are just mixes you can pull out and use. I like these ones a lot. I use them all the time, where instead of doing display none, I just include hidden, and it'll pull in a display none. And it visually would not take it out of the DOM at all. Uh, things like that. There's a ton of, like, libraries and mixes out there that you can grab. Uh, one of those is Bourbon. Bourbon is very similar to Compass, which we talked about earlier. Uh, Bourbon is basically does all these CSS things, a lot of vendor prefix things you need to deal with. Uh, Bourbon.io, uh, check it out. It's really, really cool. Compass does all these things that quickly scroll past. <laughs> and you just call them really simply. So like a, uh, I don't know, like a, 
like border, okay, border races, like, uh, I don't know, like linear gradient, right? They have different vendor prefixes, different ways to call it. You just do add include linear gradient, call it out call, and it's going to create how it should be. Cool. So that's a great, here's an example of it. Add include background image, and we're going to do linear gradient, blah, 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 uh, or, yeah, yeah, linear gradient is what we're dealing with here. Anyway, whatever, you can see how it works. It just, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about next things. Compass and Bourbon are just a huge library of those that people have already made, so you don't have to recreate them. Uh, we're going to take a just break real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Are there questions so far? Do you have a color? Oh, I don't know. Come on. Awesome. So this girl makes like YouTube videos where she dances without smiling, and it's really weird, but like you can't look away. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only reason she got on her place. <laughs> um, cool. So we're going to get into some more fun stuff. Uh, operations. This is basically just math. We do that in SAS. We kind of do this in CSS right now with the calc function, but like no one knows about it, and it doesn't always work. Uh, so we can do things here, like we're doing. Um, this is actually really useful when you because you don't want to use pixels for things. You want to use m's. So here we're doing like our font size. We want it to be 18 pixels. I divide by 16 because that's our base font size. Multiply by one m to create what the m should be. Um, same with like a width. Uh, you can do some really cool things because you can multiply by like, one m to create what the m should be. Uh, or you can wrap it in a function called m. That's what I do. So here, we've set up a variable called base font size, and we want 16 pixels for that. That's going to be basically what's applied to our body. We've created a, a function called, uh, let's pretend that says mixin, um, called, called m, where we feed in a font size, or we could potentially feed in a base font size. It's going to default to our font size that we set up. And all it's going to do is give us back our font size that we fed in divided by our base font size times one. So I think we can pick pixels. When I get a PSD, it's like I can measure by pixels. Uh, I don't really think in M's, right? But like M's are better uh, as well. So I can just do font size M, whatever pixels I want. And because we made this mix in that says mix in and it doesn't say function, we're not talking about that. Uh, fill up with that. And I also do one for some for percent sometimes. I don't know why, because it's way more characters. Um, you can do that, and it's just giving us back times 20%. And now, a really cool example of like a built in function, built in kind of mix in type thing is a color function. So we've set up our variable for background color, CCC. We've set up the text color of black. And maybe we want our border color for whatever element we're dealing with to be our background color 40% darker. So we can call the color function darken, feed it in that variable, and feed it in 40%. Um, and then our element, we can just do color, text color, background color, background color, border, the border color. Now if they're like, hey, we want the background to be darker or lighter, we just change that variable. The, the borders are automatically generated off that, so that changes as well. Um, it's really, really cool. So an example of that is we set up a base color, AD1411E should pull in, but it will in a second. Yeah, OK, cool. Here's our original color, base color. You apply two color functions, darken and lighten by 10%. It's going to automatically grab those. We can saturate and desaturate. So here we're doing that 20% each. It doesn't really look the best on a projector because they're very small values. We can do saturation and desaturation. I just you. Um, and so you can basically create all of the colors of your site off of like maybe the one or two base colors of their color scheme. And so it works really cool when you have like a sexy button. And so <laughs> we have our base color and we've done some stuff and the color of it lightening up whatever we, you know, our base color is. Our border is a little bit darker. Our text shadow a um, little bit darker. Our box shadow is based off that. And they go, oh cool, that sexy button is really sexy but it's red and I need it to be blue. Um, <laughs> so we can change that base color don't change anything in the, you know, in the actual what we've written, and it changes. And then they're like, oh, I like that sexy blue, but what about an orange? Um, you change, you know, six characters, charge them for four hours of work, and they're done. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really cool tool out there. It's called sasme.arc90.com, um, and it lets you basically feed a color and play around with all these. Um, 
function. Because uh, you can like nest them inside each other. Um, it's really cool. I mean, you can create whatever color off whatever other color. Um, now we get to really fun stuff. So we talked about mixins before. We kind of implied that we could do like if, else, and, and uh, programming John. It's really, really cool. You just do at if, and then at else if, at else. So here's a pretty big mix, and this is what I use for responsive stuff. It's called a breakpoint. Feeds in one variable, uh, one argument. Then we just do, hey, if that argument we fed in is the word tiny, we're going to output all this stuff. If it's small, we're going to output this. If it's medium, it's regular, it's large, larger, it's huge. Otherwise, we'll just create one off like a number they fed in. So when I do responsive web design, which I love, I was here last year talking about it, I don't think in like, oh, an iPhone is 320 pixels. Uh, because number one, you shouldn't be doing like exact phone sizes because every phone is different. I think, of, oh, a phone is small. Those like Galaxy phones are small, like they're slightly bigger. The tablet's kind of medium. Like a laptop, well, that's my regular size. They're huge and they're bigger. Like I think in these types of words. So when I do a media query, I don't have to remember like that pixel value or anything like that. I do. Hey, my main content on a phone. So I'm doing mobile first. So I went 90% wide. And add include breakpoint regular, I want it to be 960 pixels. When they get to like a regular computer, I want it to be this. And it's going to pull in my media query for you to um, This might not be like how your brain works, but it's how my brain works. Um, you don't have to use this for that. You can do if and else for any sort of thing you want. And you can also do, we can do some range of numbers stuff um, in SAS. We can do like a for each loop. So here we've set up a mix in a very simple one called grid. And it's basically going to create, it's going to apply border box to everything, float it left. We feed in two values, columns and I, which is whatever column we're on. It's going to create our width by taking 100 divided by columns times I times 1%. And then we want a 12 column grid system. So for I, from one to our right columns, we're going to create a class of I, and that include this mixing with that. And basically, in these 17 lines, we Cool stuff with this, you know, for each sort of junk. And it, it gets really advanced if you want it to, so we're not going to go too much farther. Uh, but you can do things like this. You can create your own grid system. And you can have this output like silent selectors, so and you can create a, your own silent grid system. Uh, oops, which we do here. So now we've created that exact same grid system with silent selectors, and then we extend one of them, and we basically create our own grid system and only output in the styles we want. So you're going to mix all these things we talked about today and do some really cool stuff. And you can do the same for each stuff with like a list of values. So here we basically done prefix defaults and we made an array um, basically. SAS treats it, you just do like space separated values and that's called prefix defaults. We made a mixing called border radius that takes in a radius, you know, the actual value and then prefixes defaulting to what we set. And then for each prefixes, so like a for each loop in PHP, we're going to output the prefix. You output it with this cool Octothorpe curly bracket thing. That's how you like output it into SAS to use. It's weird. Um, prefix, border radius, then radius. And now we, with this, we've created basically our own little prefixer. Um, you probably will never have to do this, especially if you're using Compass. Um, but there might be a project that you're going to do something similar. So it's good to know that's possible. Jib <laughs> <laughs> break number two. Uh, cool. So now let's actually build a theme. So SAS uses this magic file. SAS is written in Ruby, so it's a .rb file. It's basically a bunch of settings. Uh, so the first one is require compass. So this isn't always necessary, but we're basically saying, hey, we want to use compass. Make sure the system that we're running this on has that installed. You're 95 to 99% of the time going to have compass, so it's good to go. Our next one, oh yeah, so why compass is awesome. So not only is compass this like built-in thing of like cool mixing library, there's compass plugins that are other people basically adding more to it. So good example of that. We want Twitter Bootstrap, apparently the old version, not the new flat one. So we don't use SAS, we just want to use Twitter Bootstrap. Download the zip file. You know, like copy and paste into our, spread, our style sheet, or we're going to add it, or like enqueue another style sheet, and it's like a bunch of work. And then Twitter Bootstrap gets an update, 
And we have to redo all that work, and you hate your life, and you're just like, F it, let's just uh, bootstrap WP. Even though know, Rachel Baker's not going to maintain it now, she got hired by 10 up. Um, <laughs> but with SAS, you jump on the command called Compass Bootstrap, because there's a Compass SAS port out Twitter Bootstrap. And then you add require compass bootstrap to your config RB, like so, and you're done. You have all the styles of Twitter bootstrap. You can pull in whenever you want. Um, and this is really cool, because you can pull in, like, people make mixed libraries. Um, people make a lot of really cool CSS tools that you can use. That's really fun. Um, our next section is where our paths are and where things live. It's basically mapping out to tell SAS where our CSS and where our SAS and where our images and our JavaScript should live. So the way I do it, because I create a style that a CSS file that I want to pass in my CSS directory, my HTTP directory, or whatever, you know, wherever this config RB lives, the root of the directory. And that's the root of my theme folder. And then I tell SAS, hey, I'm going to keep all my SAS junk in a folder called SAS. Because I have a bunch of files, and like, I don't want to look clutter at my theme folder. So this basically maps out where everything is for SAS. And then our next stuff is output style, how SAS what the CSS file at outputs actually looks like. Um, so we have a bunch of different ones. We have expanded, looks like normal CSS that most of us are probably writing. Uh, we have nested, which is really cool. It makes it, puts the last curly on the line before, so it kind of mimics what your SAS file might look like, and it makes it look nested. Um, we have compact, we'll squish it all, put it all on one line. And then when you're actually pushing the line and making production, you do compressed squeezes, squeeze it into the most minified, smallest one it can do. And then we have line comments. I'm an example of this, but if you turn it on, every single um, like CSS thing, it'll put a little CSS comment that says, hey, this was generated from line 23 of this file.scss, which helps you in debugging because you know everything maps to. Um, so let's actually build a WordPress theme with SAS. Our goals with that are we only want one CSS file. We don't want a bunch of them. We don't want to act in queue another one. We want one style.css. Uh, we want our SAS folder to be in its own folder and not be dictated by Because um, we're going to use CodeKit, maybe eventually to optimize images or do some JavaScript stuff, whatever. Uh, this is actually mapped out exactly what my theme looks like. On GitHub, you can check it out. Send me a pull request if you want to improve it. And so because we've mapped out our CSS directory, to so just slash and pass, um, we have a style.scss in that SAS folder. And we do one little simple thing. So uh, by default, SAS will strip out all the comments we have in our SAS file. But in our, we want our theme header to be here. And this is something that trips up a lot of people building WordPress themes in SAS. A lot of times they'll have a CSS file that add imports like SAS slash style.scss. So if we put this little uh, exclamation point right when we begin our comment, it'll tell SAS, hey, this is an important comment. Don't ever take it out. And so now when we generate our CSS file, it's going to keep our you know, theme header there. Uh, yeah, so that's how you build a WordPress theme with SAS. So there's some tools to learn SAS and play around with it. If you want to just play around with some of the stuff we taught, maybe like type up some of these examples we gave. You can go to SAS Meister. It's actually what I use to take screenshots. You don't have to install SAS. You can just use it. Um, CodePen.io, you've probably heard of that. It lets you flip to SAS instead of writing CSS. Let you play around with some of these simple things without installing it. Uh, the sasway.com is a really great resource to learn um, a bunch of stuff you want, want to learn. And here's a bunch of links. Don't write them down because the slides are online. Uh, some presentations, some more articles about using SAS. They're really helpful. Uh, cool. So I'm Brad Parbs. Here's my slides. It's r.parbs.me slash r1 capital M.